Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Community of Grace, this beautiful, beautiful morning. Please stand if you're able and, in, and join us in our uh, first song, which is Freedom is Coming. Good morning. Have a seat. Who is the last person to buy a new car around here? Behind is it Paul? You just bought a new car. How many cool, fancy things are on it? I, I don't even know. You can't even do them all because there's so many buttons? Yeah, that's what happens to me, too. But the most important thing, um, Paul, does your car have brakes? It does. Does he use them? He doesn't use them. No, no. <laughs> For all the fancy things out there, you want your car to have the airbags and the, the little mirrors so you can see people. Um, it doesn't matter like how much research you do and watch the videos of crash test or you know you can watch every other driver because the other drivers are always the worst ones right it's always other it's never you but safety is so important when it comes to a car and it should be the same when it comes to a church. It has to be the case here that we are safe, um, a place that feels safe when we come together, not shamed by the past, where we can have hope for the future. This has to be a place where visitors feel welcome and where old timers still feel at home even though they know things are changing all the time. This has to be a place where our souls feel sacred with God. And so today's worship service is really all about safety. Um, if later in the service, much later in the service, if you feel like we have drilled uh, safety into your head a lot and you're just going to have to, like, leave this space because, you know, it's just a fire is burning in your soul, um, notice that there are exits over there. There's <laughs> one behind over there. There's one over there. If you go out here, you might get lost. So there are three, but you can. You can go out that way. But there are three exits and... Um, you know, if that happens later in the service, we're all going to gather out on the, the sunny little steps out there, and we're going to sing our closing song. Uh, I think just the uke is going to lead us in our closing song and things. So that's going to happen a lot later. Before it gets really loud, let's have a moment of silence. Good morning. Good morning. That sounds good. Oh, oh, something I learned a long time ago on Sunday morning when the greeter says good morning, if you say good morning, their name back. It makes them feel so good. We're not going to do that this morning. <laughs> I had a big move yesterday from apartment 327 down to 201. And um, Robin had the nerve to call the deacons. <laughs> and a whole bunch of you folks showed up. And I'm going to, I think I have everybody's name. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll try. Maria was there. Yes, you were. Um, Kyla, Kila, did I say that right? Kayla. Okay, got that one right. Connor Larson, uh, Rob Riley. 
Uh, let's see. Oh, Sandy Killian was coming, but we were done. She had to give blood first, which is good. And I didn't want her to pass out on the way <sighs> or something. I, I've, I've never had the privilege of being up here, and I always find when I get in a new pulpit, it's amazing what the pastor has up here. <laughs> There's two hymnals, one of each kind. A lot of Kleenex. I mean a lot of Kleenex. <laughs> a Bible. And I, I guess I don't understand the flamethrower. <laughs> But just in case that doesn't work, there's a second one. Is that to bring down fire? Fire drill today. Oh. Don't start any fires. <laughs> I'm sorry. Will you join me in our call to worship, please? Prayer is sometimes real selves trying to communicate with the real. Grace meets you right where it finds you. Have you become more courageous, which is the ultimate healing? Have you become more patient, which is the close second? May we become ever so kind to ourselves. Please join us if you can. Uh, singing God gave this world again. Was I supposed to do something else? No. who are watching online today. We welcome them and now share the peace of Christ with your neighbor.
All right, this is the time we're going to have the children come on forward to the rainbow. I know Charlotte gets to come to the rainbow her first time, so come on up, all the youngsters. Okay, when you're on a playground, what's your favorite thing to play on? Monkey bars? I'm a rock climber, and it would scare me not to have a rope. But you're so brave. Okay, what else is your favorite? The slide? When I was a kid, our slides had rust, and they were 1,000 degrees, and they burned you, and they scratched you. No thanks. Sounds scary to me. Do you have a favorite? Swing set? Are you the kind of person who can swing and then, like, jump off at the top? How do you get so brave? I'm such a chicken. Now, if we were doing teeter-totter, I think I could handle Alora in the teeter-totter. I could probably launch her up in the sky pretty good on a, on a big teeter-totter. No? Oh, she got injured in that? Because of you. Okay, this is confession on the rainbow, it sounds like. <laughs> confession. You know, playgrounds can be scary. Uh, there's, a, there's a balance of all real fun is a balance between a little bit of scary and a little bit of safety. If it's too scary, it's not fun. If it's too easy, it's not fun. So you need a little bit of balance. And I think the same is with God and even with church. It can be a little scary to meet new people and to learn new ideas and to try to love each other when that's really hard. It can be scary to, to teach ourselves to do that. But God always wants you to know that mistakes are okay. That's part of the game. God always wants you to know that God's love is way bigger than any of our fears. And God wants you to know that this church is always your home, no matter what happens in the world. So let's pray about that. Hey, God. When I am swinging so high or sliding down to the ground, thank you for being always my friend. Always. Amen. Okay, some of you are probably going to hang out with Marie and Cammie. Some are going to hang out with their favorite aunt. And the rest of you get to hang out with me. First of all, I apologize, I misspoke. There's a Bible up here, too. <laughs> Just so. Will you pray with me? Lord, open our hearts, minds, and souls as we unpack the words of your Holy Scripture. May they bring us to new life and new understanding and a great joy to serve you. We pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus the Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. So hear the words of the Lord this morning from Luke, chapter 18, verses 9 through 14. Then Jesus told this story to some people who had great confidence in their righteousness and great contempt for everyone else. Two men went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, a Jewish perfectionist. And the other was a tax collector, a despised Roman agent of occupation. This has nothing to do with April 15th tomorrow. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed this prayer. I thank you, God, that I am like, not like other people, the thieves, the sinners, and the adulterers. I am certainly not like the tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give one-tenth of my income. But the tax collector stood at a distance and dared not even lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed instead. He beat his chest in sorrow, saying, O oh Lord God, be merciful for me. I am a sinner. 
I tell you this story. The second man, not the first, went home justified before God. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Last church I went to, I used to my last pulpit, uh, they had a joke there years before that somebody put an alarm clock under here at 11 o'clock sharp, uh, and the, the pastor before me just kept on preaching and kept on preaching and kept on preaching. That alarm clock went off, and she was so terrified. She had no idea. It was like a fire drill for her. But it was the joke of, like, their, their person back there was like, it, sermons only go so far. You better, like, we got to get to lunch. So, uh, so yeah, tax day is tomorrow. Um, does anyone have some work still to do on your taxes? We're all done. This is where we are all overachievers. Everyone's ready. This Christmas, you'll be done with your shopping by December 16th. This is a good church, yeah. So taxes come up all the time in the New Testament, a little less so in the Hebrew Bible. I'm going to tell you why that is, but first of all, I'm, I'm going to answer that question, but I want you to know that tax season, it, it's some of you, it's scary, it's, it brings up anxiety. I promise there'll be a spiritual message in here. I promise we're not going to get stuck in the frustration or the history. Dear God, some of you know I can get stuck in the history of the Bible, um, but I promise if you walk with me for a few minutes, to kind of set a little of the background of this story, we're going to land this plane in a good place, okay? So in the, in the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, um, people complained about taxes because people are people, and that's what we do. We complain about taxes. Every culture, every government, no matter how high or low they are, people worry about death and they complain about taxes. The ancient Hebrews who were enslaved in Egypt, uh, so in some way, the, the taxes were raised on them and they complained. Good reason to complain. You're already enslaved and now you have higher taxes. Uh, later, when David and Solomon were building these massive temples and mansions, and they had to fund that, and so they taxed all the people. People complained, of course. Uh, later, the prophets, that's the, the, all the funny names, short books at the end of the Old Testament, uh, they told, they said, these rich people are not paying their taxes, and they're stealing money from the poor people. And so that's a pretty good reason to complain. That's only history, right? Never have anything to do with today. But in the New Testament, once you get to the books at the end, 
When the Roman Empire was occupying the Israel and Palestine and Syria and Jordan and all of it, at that little slice of history, we only see a few, you know, a few decades, there was an even better reason to complain about taxes. See, the Romans, they were, they were really good at conquering lands, and of course they taxed the people that they conquered, obviously, that's fine, that's normal. But how they did it really got under the skin, uh, and Jesus cared about people, and he cared about their feelings, and he cared about their conditions, and he cared about justice, especially for the poor and the marginalized. So Jesus cared about taxes, and he cared about how they were collected. So here was Rome's strategy. It took two parts. And get ready to thank God for the IRS, because this is a lot worse than what we have. Okay? First, imagine that Rome conquered Utah. Okay? Rome came in and conquered Utah one county at a time, one little city at a time. And what they wanted to do for taxes is they said, okay, um, the people up that li live near the university, they're pretty wealthy and they, they support the, the Utes, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to grab someone from Provo in Utah County and we're going to hire them to tax them so that there's naturally animosity in between, right? You get that? If they were going to tax the people in Tooele, they'd grab someone from Capitol Hill to go out there and tax them. Now, the reason for this is that they did not want their tax collectors to have compassion, and so they built into the system this natural animosity between places. It's kind of smart if that's what you care about, but um, you can imagine just how angry that made people to have their outsiders do it. You, you see bureaucrats do this all the time when they see kind of the most marginalized communities that feel like a threat, and then they'll, they'll go in there and they'll push down voting rights or zoning issues or redlining for real estate, or whatever. Maybe you've dealt with it. But they built in no forgiveness, no compassion. So first, you start with that frustration around tax collection. And then, who are these tax collectors? Well, picture uh, old Joseph and Mary. You know, Joseph, he's a, he's a carpenter. And so he's going to be in the 20% tax bracket, whatever they had back then. And some Roman citizen, probably from Samaria, comes up and knocks on the door and says, you know, you owe 20%, but you owe me 25%. And Joseph says, what? That's too much. And the tax collector says, well, you, we can go down to Jerusalem. Um, you're going to pay the way, and you're going to pay for the judge, and you have to pay for the lawyer, and you have to pay for any witnesses. Um, and you know what? You're going to pay, because you're just going to have to pay. You lose. You pay. So he pays. Uh, do you think the tax collectors played that game with wealthy folks who could pay to fight those injustices? Of course not. They just picked on the on the. the, the, the people who didn't have money. So when you see tax collector in the New Testament, I mean, it broadly, it just means tax cheat, but specifically, it means someone with middling power using institutional power to cheat people who don't have power. And again, that might sound familiar to a lot of you. And what that means is even, even imagine, you know, if that happened, I don't know, two out of 10 times, you get a lot of anxiety. But then maybe the, the person coming up to Joseph and Mary is a totally honest tax collector, just totally honest at what they're going to do. But do you trust them when they say, Joseph, you owe 20%? And Joseph says, eh, I don't know. My neighbor got cheated. I don't know if I'm going to trust you. And so then you start being suspicious, and then you start being resentful. And given the rot in the whole system, everyone has to be careful and anxious, and they start to have divisions in their neighborhood. So when Jesus walks in, everyone wants to know, his neighbors want to know, how do you feel about this broken tax system that's hurting me financially, hurting me in every way? And Jesus is just as concerned with how it hurts their peace, how it hurts their heart, how it hurts their community. And this is the hard Jesus part that I can't ever understand. He also cares about how those tax collectors feel. That's a hard move. He cares about... The tax collectors who are good and just accused, some of us have been that. Some of us have been accused of things, and it just gnaws on us for our whole lives. Some of us have been stuck in this cloud of greed that just the world works this way. We can't see another way through it. Jesus even cares about those who are infected with hubris and entitlement, hopeful that they find some way to atonement. Now, all those historical details, they barely matter. I'm telling you that just to see how Jesus enters a difficult conversation with a layered sense of justice and compassion and dreams for transformation. 
And so whatever the topic, you can go all through the New Testament. It's the same story. If the topic is addiction, if the topic is the sex trade, if the topic is racism, if it's health care, if it's disability rights, Jesus tries to help people to see deeper into the pain and the hope that frames all those experiences. And for us, it, on tax day, it's easy. It is right. It is our duty to complain about the Bezos and the Musks and when they get tax rebates for their yachts and then teachers have to go buy their own watercolor paints. It's right to challenge that. And it is right to be angry at anyone who takes advantage of the poor. And yet somehow, Jesus found it in his heart to meet those cheaters as people separate from what they did. Oscar Wilde said, it is a powerful thing to see the world in all its tainted glory and to keep showing up in the ugly places. And Jesus showed up in all the ugliest places with grace because that's what holiness does. That's what holiness is about. And holiness is hard. It's hard. It's, it's, it's hard for us. It's a hard measuring stick to hold us to because there are ugly, there's ugliness and there's grossness in the way that people uh, game the economy, the Enrons and the Madoffs and the trickle-down charlatans. We know there's something gross about the way that powerful people just take what they want, like the Harvey Weinsteins and the Sean Combs and the grab them and the president himself. We know what it's like for celebrities to lie to us. We know what it's like for our neighbors to get, just get caught up in these games. We recognize when we cannot help but be part of these broken systems ourselves. And if we can fight that ugliness and still meet each other as people with mercy, if we can meet ourselves with self-love, if we can still hope for transformation for individuals and for societies, that is holy work, and that is the embodiment of what Jesus is bringing into the world. Now, I'm, I'm not the one that's called to have grace necessarily, to sit at table with Bernie Madoff or Elon Musk. None of you are the ones probably who are called to change the mind of those deregulation lobbyists. None of us have the power to break into the heart of the deep tax cheats. But you know who can do that? You know who did that? You know how we have stories of who can do that? That's Jesus. Jesus did it in this and other stories. The Holy Spirit does it in our lives and in other lives. Invites us, the Holy Spirit does, to see the world with equity beyond guilt. The Holy Spirit invites us to see a soul more than a, the stealing itself. She invites us to see the ways of the world and to rehearse a better kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Now, if we, if we do that, if we choose to practice living in the kind of world that we want to live in, even just a little, imagine the community, or just imagine the family that could be built on that rich layer of grace. Imagine that way of thinking about life and of God that's not about judgment and punishment and what you deserve and eternal damnation, but imagine a life where you are consistently safe in the arms of God. Imagine a safe spirituality that informs a practical engagement. Imagine a church that takes seriously the call to fight those systems of oppression with, of course, love for the victims, but also a reasonable grace for the ones who are implicated by those systems. And I say reasonable grace. What's that? Well, um, I have stood in a doorway, just like that one out there. I've stood in the doorway once at church, once at home, between a man and the woman he beat almost to death. I once stood right in between a very angry man and the son that he, little boy, he abused. I have no amount of Jesus in me to get those men to reconsider their behavior, and at least two of them had a gun on them, so this was no space to make some grand point, to kind of make it a story so everyone could learn. And wherever that redemption, those men need redemption, wherever it's going to happen, it ain't next to their victim, and it's not going to be in the pews next to their victim. So there is such a thing as unreasonable grace or maybe grace at the wrong time in the wrong place, because if I've learned anything in all my church years and the shortcomings of popular church phrases. You know, drive all around. You're going to see a phrase on almost every church. It says, all are welcome, right? You see that on every church. Sometimes people mean it. Sometimes they don't. But let me tell you, all are welcome 
means, if you really want to get down to what that really means, all are welcome means some are not. All are welcome means that the ones who are consistently creating unwelcome environments by violence or ideology are not welcome to abuse the members in a church. And I say that because churches should be the most safe place there is the most safe place to be who you are, the most safe place to be honored for all of who you are. Churches should be safe places for you to be even guided to the best expressions of who you are, not changing you, but guiding you to meet with the Spirit to become the best you. Churches should be safe places for broken people to heal without breaking other people. And that means, as the person who runs his mouth the most in this church, I get that uh, nomaker there, um, churches should be safe from broken ideas about God. Churches should be safe from a lot of the bad ideas that hurt people. And we here, are, we're trying to be all about healing in all ways, and that means from our heart to our head. So we should be safe from bad teaching. We should be safe to serve in ways that are life-giving. And that means me not asking you to do too much. In the last 10 days, three people have told me no. I love it. That's the most no's I've had in this church in three years. So it must mean we're getting to know each other a little better, that I can ask you something and you can tell me no. I really do. It's, it's like the second best answer there is. First best answer is yes. Second best answer, no, I'm not. I can't do that right now. I have boundaries. Great. Fantastic. That's safety here. We should be safe in a way where you can grow from your service. We should be safe for those visitors to feel comfortable and those old timers to feel at home. We should be safe in spirit and in the words we use with each other. We should be safe with the logistics, like the kids' safety that's going on. We have all, all kinds of procedures for the kids, but we should be safe for the tripping hazards. I watched Tim helping Millie in the door today. We should be safe with allergen-free snacks. I saw Betsy la two weeks ago, last time I was here, allergen-free snacks. We should be safe with Bible translation that do not promote misogynist stereotypes. And the list goes on. So I'm going to land this plane, like I promised. Um, one of the clearest ways to summarize the gospel of Jesus, for tender hearts and for hard-nosed justice, it, it's a really easy phrase. He comforted the afflicted, and he afflicted the comfortable. You've heard that? But especially when it comes to folks like those despised tax collectors, Jesus knew that they were afflicted also. They were afflicted by their hearts and by the communities around them. And so, as a step to shape a world that is safe for all, he found ways to hold their humanity while challenging the ways in which they were erasing their own sense of worthiness. And he did the same. Some of the, the key groups he reached out to, he reached out to drunks, and he said, hey, you are more than your addiction. Let's give you a safe place to belong before you believe, before you get clean. He did the same for prostitutes. He said, hey, the world blames you and only you for this whole mess that you are caught up in as a victim. But I don't judge you, and I see something true in your soul. He did the same for these roughneck teenagers. Most of those guys, those first 12 apostles, most of them were teenagers with no future. And he trusted them, and he showed them what it's like to be trusted and to have control. Jesus does not offer grace only to the good or only to the okay. But if you want grace and if you want a world that is safe from a deep web of judgment, Jesus offers grace to all. It's all that easy, and it's all that hard. Amen.
All right, you may be seated. I'm going to hand um, Barb two things here. Let's make sure this thing is on for you, Barb. Uh, first of all, this is a, uh, a, a, a grant to the Gun Violence Prevention of Utah. Uh, the church, through Nancy, applied for a grant, and we won $2,000 so they can continue uh, that work. That's one way that we're able to do special mission is through grants like that. Another way is here straight from her. We are going to talk to you about the Refugee and Immigrant Support and Encouragement, which is uh, blessedly reduced to the f term RAISE. And there is another uh, explanation, by the way, in your uh, back of your bulletin. Um, so Paul and I are here to describe our engagement with the COG Refugee uh, Program. I think I can speak for the four of us that have worked together. That would be Becky and Janae and Paul and I. It's been an incredibly enriching experience. Um, it's just hard, hard to put into words what it's meant for us. Um, we... Um, we have a heavily edited script here. I'm glad this is a safe church. <laughs> <laughs> so Catholic Community Services uh, provided support for the family, provides support for families for one year. And they cover rent and connected our family to various social services to help them. And then after CCS support ended, the family was expected to pay the rent, manage transportation, utilities, food, benefits of many kinds, and of course, the dreaded taxes. We felt they were not ready to assume all this, and so we have stayed on as mentors for this family. We helped the family uh, manage their finances. You can imagine how difficult it is to live with a family of six on $37,000. The, um, occasionally, the, um, uh, they would fall short, and um, we have reached out to church members and ourselves have helped them in those uh, times kind of of crisis. That's me. Um, Seems like something missing. Okay. Our Afghan family is not the only family supported by our church. Um, Tim, Dorothy, Nancy, Dave, Linda have tutored children of uh, Iranian family. Tell me if I'm wrong. Iraqi? Iraqi uh, family. Uh, we have uh, Cami and Paul have supported Ukrainian refugees in their home. And we have a Congolese family in our church that worship here every Sunday. Our, oh, got that. Okay. A couple of times with our Afghan family, there was not enough money for rent, and we were able to raise generous donations to help them. The RAISE program will provide a consistent cache of funds for emergencies for the various families that we support. There are envelopes in the bulletin and a button on the website where you can make a one-time donation or a recurring monthly donation. As the funds accrue, which we, we hope they were, well, uh, a small, small donation. Uh, they do add up over time. And uh, we would deeply appreciate that uh, for help with, with these families. Uh, the Mission and Justice community, uh, community will manage the funds and determine their use. We hope that our congregation will continue to reach out to refugee families in this way. So we'd like to close with Matthew 25. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked at me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Amen. Thank you.
I'll just change one word from that announcement. It's, we, we don't have a Congolese family. We have a Congolese church that meets here every afternoon, and they're growing like crazy. Um, Pastor Issa, who you, some of you have met, um, he's trying to buy a van so that he can bring his, his community here a lot. Uh, and so I keep telling him, you know, don't forget uh, insurance and, and getting a license and all those important things. So, like, the raise fund might be to help him get license plates for a van that they're able to buy by themselves, things like that. Um, uh, a couple other little announcements here before we, we pray is that um, Joan O'Hare, she did have a stroke this week, um, a proper stroke. She it came through the ICU. She's uh, in acute care. She's doing the, the speech homework. Her speech is, is pretty good. Her mobility is pretty good. Uh, Marcy says, please don't make a, a, a big thing, but if you want to send cards, send those through Marcy. Um, she, Joan's not ready for visitors in the hospital, um, but she's pretty confident on her recovery schedule. And the other, before I, I pray her name, I want you to know of, of Tanya. Um, way back in like 2004, or five, six, something like that, I broke my back and then uh, I tried to recover and it just wasn't for my sport, it wasn't working. And so, uh, so then I just got like, oh, I still have to show that I'm tough. And so I just jumped in the Boston Marathon to run the Boston, I'd never run a marathon. I'd run once that whole year. And so I hopped in and uh, I'm taking off and I'm at like mile six and I catch, the, out of the corner of my eye, this, this really pretty lady running by me, and she was faster than me. And so I, the corner of my eye, kept looking over there. She didn't have legs. She had two prosthetic legs, and she just walked right by me, just flew by me. Okay? So um, Sylvia has a friend named Tanya, who is a double amputee, who's running the Boston Marathon tomorrow. Uh, and so for, and she's, she's been a big survivor of a lot of things, and this is a, a pretty huge, huge step for her. So let's pray for all those things. And when we get to the Lord's Prayer, remember that announcement at the beginning of the service about the loud, but if you have hearing-assisted devices, you might want to turn those off during the Lord's Prayer, or else that extra buzz might be a lot. So, God of the Sabbath, remind us that rest is not a burden. When we slow down, we are showing people how to get free. I was meant for more than giving. I do not owe this world my body. I am worthy to lie down. Calm our fears, spirit, away from those inclinations to overwork and get exhausted. Attune our hearts to notice our deeper needs. Show us where to feel safe and to breathe deeply. And Jesus, who always comforted the afflicted, may your good news be an echo loudly to the world. For those who feel a need to hide in order to be safe, if you have still not said it out loud, God is proud of you. Any belonging that depends on your hiding is not belonging, it is bondage. So know it again, your dignity, you are made of glory. And for those people in our lives whose glory is shadowed by pain, we pray. We pray for Cheryl Manson, who is recovering well from last week's fall down the stairs and a broken neck. We pray for Brooke's friend, Rebecca, whose cancer is back, and Brooke's family member, Linda, in the hospital with kidney problems. We pray for James's friend, Curtis, who has COVID at 85, and for James's brother-in-law struggling with arthritis. We pray for Tanya's courage and strength tomorrow, and we pay, pray for Joan O'Hare recovering from her stroke. This we pray together with all creation through the words you taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. 